हेलो स्टूडेंट वेलकम टू ईपीजी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर राजीव जैन फ्रॉम जिवाजी यूनिवर्सिटी ग्वालियर टुडे वी शैल इन दिस मॉड्यूल डिस्कस ग्रेविमेट्रिक मेथड्स ऑफ एनालिसिस अंडर द पेपर फंडामेंटल्स ऑफ एनालिटिकल केमिस्ट्री एज द नेम इंडिकेट्स ग्रेविमेट्रिक एनालिसिस इज द एनालाइज क्वांटिटेटिव एनालिसिस by taking the weight of a substance as you know there are two types of classical analysis which are being used from very old days classical analysis quantitative analysis it may be volumetric analysis when we take volume and gravimetric analysis when we take the weight of the substance to be analyzed so it is a analysis when we take the substance a solution is given to us and has been asked to find out the concentration of the sample concentration of the sample given to find out the amount of that substance dissolved in the solution how to find out that so in the gravimetric analysis it is find out it is calculated it is determined by taking the weight of that substance how to take the weight of the substance for that purpose usually we add some precipitant we add some substance with which the dissolved substance which is to be analyzed form precipitate it forms precipitate and then we take its weight so usually for separation purposes we have three or four methods one of the methods is the separation by gravimetric method that is that is by precipitation number one method number two method may be by chromatographic method chromatography or and extraction methods by solvent extraction or solid phase extraction we do separations and get the product separated product or another method is electroanalytical methods are there for the separation but here in gravimetric methods we add something we add some solvent we add some chemical we add some substance and we precipitate this compound and calculate it for example if I, i have been asked to find out the concentration of silver silver in the given solution then how i can find out by taking the weight quantitatively by using gravimetric method for that purpose i have to add certain things with which it forms a solid precipitate like silver chloride or any other thing it forms a solid precipitate if nickel is there then it should form nickel dimethyl glyoxide i will add dimethyl glyoxide and it will form a precipitate of nickel dimethyl glyoxide i will filter it and on filtration i will take out the weight of the nickel dimethyl glyoxide and by reverse calculation i will find out what is the concentration of nickel given in the solution this is the gravimetric analysis which we shall study in detail the first step in gravimetric analysis is the precipitation how to precipitate the constituent from the solution the constituent being determined is precipitated from solution in a form which is so slightly soluble that no appreciable loss occurs when the precipitate is separated by filtration and weight thus in the determination of silver a solution of the substance is treated with an excess of sodium chloride or potassium chloride solution the precipitate is filtered off well washed to remove soluble salts dried at at 130 to 150 degrees centigrade and weighed as silver chloride as shown in figure 1 and 2 frequently the constituent being determined is weighed in a form other than that in which it was precipitated the following factors determine a successful analysis by precipitation the precipitate must be so insoluble that no appreciable loss occurs when it is collected by filtration in practice this usually means that the quantity remaining in solution does not exceed the minimum detectable by the ordinary analytical balance that is 0.1 mg the physical nature of the precipitate must be such 
that it can be readily separated from the solution by filtration and can be washed free of soluble impurities. These conditions require that the precipitate are of size that they do not pass through the filtering medium and that the particle size is unaffected by the washing process. The precipitate must be convertible into a pure substance of definite chemical composition. This may be affected either by ignition or by a simple chemical operation such as evaporation with a suitable liquid. The problem which arise with certain precipitates include the coagulation or flocculation of a colloidal dispersion of a finely divided solid to permit its filtration and prevents its repeptization upon washing the precipitate. It is therefore desirable to understand the basic principles of the colloid chemistry of precipitate. The colloidal state of matter is distinguished by a certain range of particle size as a consequence of which certain characteristic properties become apparent. Colloidal properties are in general exhibited by substances of particle size ranging between 0.1 micrometer and 1 nanometer. Ordinarily, quantitative filter paper will retain particles down to a diameter of about 10 raised to power minus 2 millimeter or 10 micrometer so that colloidal solutions in this respect behave like true solutions and are not filtrable. The limit of vision under the microscope is about 0.2 micrometer. If a powerful beam of light is passed through a colloidal solution and the solution viewed at right angle to that incident light, a scattering of light is observed. This is so-called Tyndall effect which is not exhibited by true solutions. An important consequence of the smallness of the size of colloid particles is that the ratio of surface area to weight is extremely large. Phenomena such as adsorption which depend upon the size of the surface will therefore play an important part with substances in the colloidal state. For convenience, colloids are divided into two main groups designated as lyophobic and lyophilic colloids. The process of dispersing a gel or a flocculated solid to form a sol is called peptidation. The stability of lyophobic colloids is intimately associated with the electrical charge on the particles. Thus, in the formation of an arsenic 3 sulfide sol by precipitation with hydrogen sulfide in acid solution, sulfide ions are primarily adsorbed and some hydrogen ions are secondarily adsorbed. The hydrogen ions or other ions which are secondarily adsorbed have been termed as counter ions. Thus, the so-called electrical double layer is set up between the particles and the solution. The colloidal particles of arsenic 3 sulfide have negatively charged surface with positively charged counter ions which impart a positive charge to the liquid immediately surrounding it. If an electric current is passed through the solution, the negative particles will move towards the anode. The speed is comparable with that of electrolytic ions. The electrical conductivity of a sol, however, quite low because the number of current carrying particles is small compared with that in a solution of an electrolyte at an appreciable concentration. The large charge carried by the colloid particles is not sufficient to compensate for their smaller number. If the electrical double layer is destroyed, the sol is no longer stable and the particles will flocculate, thereby reducing the large surface area. Thus, if barium chloride solution is added, barium ions are preferentially adsorbed by the particles, the charge distribution on the surface is disturbed and the particles flocculate. After flocculation, it is found that the dispersion medium is acidic owing to the liberation of the hydrogen counter ions. It appears that ions of opposite charge to those primarily adsorbed on the surface are necessary for coagulation. The minimum amount of electrolyte necessary to cause flocculation of the colloid is called the flocculation or coagulation value. 
during the flocculation of a collide by electrolyte, the ions of opposite sign to that of the collide are adsorbed to a varying degree on the surface. The higher the charge of the ion, the more strongly is it adsorbed. In all cases, the precipitate will be contaminated by surface adsorption. Upon washing, the precipitate with water, part of the adsorbed electrolyte is removed and a new difficulty may arise. The electrolyte concentration in the supernatant liquid may fall below the coagulation value and the precipitate may pass into the colloidal solution again. This phenomenon which is known as peptidization is of great importance in quantitative analysis. By way of illustration, consider the precipitation of silver by excess of chloride ions in acid solution and the subsequent washing of the coagulated silver chloride with water. The adsorbed hydrogen ions will be removed by washing process and a portion of the precipitate may pass through the filter. If, however, washing is carried out with dilute nitric acid, no peptidization occurs. For this reason, precipitates are always washed with a suitable solution of an electrolyte which does not interfere with the subsequent step in the determination. During the process of precipitate formation in gravimetric analysis, while adding precipitate, it is very important to keep in mind that we should avoid the stage of supersaturation because it may particle size and depending upon the various things, it may hinder the process of precipitation. So for that purpose, we should do something that use super saturation is avoided. How to avoid it? Generally, precipitation should be carried out in hot solutions from and the solution should be homogeneous from which precipitation is taking place, in which precipitation is taking place, a hot solution of homogeneous solution is taken from which precipitation is to be taken place and precipitate is added and during the stage of precipitation that should, solution should be stirred, should be smoothly stirred so that a bigger particle size is obtained. When a precipitate separates from a solution, it is not always perfectly pure. It may contain varying amounts of impurities dependent upon the nature of the precipitate and the conditions of precipitation. The contamination of the precipitate by substances which are normally soluble in the mother liquor is termed as co-precipitation. We must distinguish between two important types of co-precipitation. The first is concerned with the adsorption at the surface of the particles exposed to the solution and the second relates to the occlusion of foreign substances during the process of crystal growth from the primary particles. With regard to the surface adsorption, this will in general be greatest for gelatinous precipitate and least for those of pronounced macrocrystalline character. Precipitates with ionic lattices appear to conform to the Spanish Fajans Han adsorption rule, which states that the ion that is most strongly adsorbed by an ionic substance is that ion which forms the least soluble salt. Thus, on springly soluble sulfates, it is found that calcium ions are adsorbed preferentially over magnesium ions because calcium sulfate is less soluble than magnesium sulfate. Silver chloride adsorbs silver acetate much more strongly than it does silver nitrate under comparable conditions, since the former is less soluble. The deformability of the adsorbed ions and the electrolyte dissociation of the adsorbed compound also have a considerable influence. The smaller the dissociation of the compound, the greater is the adsorption. Thus, hydrogen sulfide, a weak electrolyte, is strongly adsorbed by metallic sulfide. The second type of co-precipitation may be visualized as occurring during the building up of precipitates from the primary particles. The latter will be subject to a certain amount of surface adsorption and during their coalescence, the impurities will either be 
partially eliminated if large single crystals are formed and the process takes place slowly or if coalescence is rapid large crystals composed of loosely bound small crystals may be produced and some of the impurities may be entrained within the walls of the large crystals if the impurity is isomorphous or forms a solid solution with the precipitate the amount of co precipitation may be very large since there will be no tendency for elimination during the aging process the latter actually occurs during the precipitation of barium sulfate in the presence of alkali nitrate in this particular case x ray studies have shown that the abnormally large co precipitation is due to the formation of solid solutions fortunately such cases are comparatively rare in analysis appreciable errors may also be introduced by post precipitation post precipitation is the precipitation which occurs on the surface of the first precipitate after its formation it occurs with sprinkly soluble substances which form super saturated solutions they usually have an ion in common with the primary precipitate thus in the precipitation of calcium as oxalate in the presence of magnesium magnesium oxalate separates out gradually upon the calcium oxalate the longer the precipitate is allowed to stand in contact with the solution the greater is the error due to this cause a similar effect is observed in the precipitation of copper or mercury to sulfide in 0.3 molar hydrochloric acid in the presence of zinc ion zinc sulfide is slowly post precipitated now comparison of post precipitation with co precipitation post precipitation differs from co precipitation in several respects number 1 the contamination increases with time that the precipitate is left in contact with the mother liquor in post precipitation but usually decreases in co precipitation with post precipitation contamination increases the faster the solution is agitated by either mechanical or thermal means the reverse is usually true with co precipitation next slide the magnitude of contamination by post precipitation may be much greater than in co precipitation the next process is the digestion digestion or aging means to increase the size of the digestion is done to increase the size of the precipitate particles usually this is done by keeping the precipitate in in in, in solution for t- uh, 12 to 24 hours by this what happen the solution it should be in hot conditions size of the particles grow and co precipitation is avoided so co- for avoiding co precipitation and also by taking hot solutions and then adding precipitate slowly slowly gradually super saturation is also avoided so in this process usually the solution is kept before filtration for 12 to 24 hours so that to go to avoid co precipitation unless there are chances of post precipitation in some cases there are few cases if it is kept for longer hours then post precipitation may occur uh, but if there are no chances of post precipitation then aging should be done digestion should be done for about 12 to 24 hours and after that when we have crystals of sufficient size then filtration is done after precipitation and digestion are complete the precipitate is separated from solution by filtration using either filter paper or a filtering crucible the most common filtering medium is cellulose based filter paper which is classified according to its filtering speed its size and its as content on ignition filtering speed is a function of the paper pore size which determines the particle size retained by the filter filter paper is rated as fast medium fast medium and slow the proper choice of filtering speed is important if the filtering speed is too fast the precipitate may pass through the filter paper 
resulting in a loss of precipitate. On the other hand, the filter paper can become clogged when using a filter paper that is too slow. Filter paper is hygroscopic and is not easily dried to a constant weight. As a result, in quantitative procedure, the filter paper must be removed before weighing the precipitate. This is accomplished by carefully igniting the filter paper. After ignition, a residue of non-combustible inorganic ash remains that contributes a positive determinant error to the precipitate's final mass. For quantitative analytical procedures, a low ash filter paper must be used. This grade of filter paper is pre-treated by washing with a mixture of SCL and HF to remove inorganic materials. Filter paper classified as quantitative has an ash content of less than 0.010% weight by weight. Qualitative filter paper typically has a maximum ash content of 0.06% weight by weight. Filtering is accomplished by folding the filter paper into a cone, which is then placed in a long stem funnel as shown in figure 4. A seal between the filter cone and the funnel is formed by dampening the paper with water and pressing the paper to the wall of the funnel as shown in the figure. When properly prepared, the stem of the funnel will fill with the solution being filtered, increasing the rate of filtration. Filtration is accomplished by the force of gravity. The precipitate is transferred to the filter in several steps. The first step is to decant the majority of the superintendent through the filter paper with transferring the precipitate. This is done to prevent the filter paper from becoming clogged at the beginning of the filtration process. Initial rinsing of the precipitate is done in the beaker in which the precipitate was formed. These rinsings are also decanted through the filter paper. Finally, the precipitate is transferred onto the filter paper using a stream of rinse solution. Any precipitate clinging to the walls of the beaker is transferred using a rubber policeman. An alternative method for filtering the precipitate is a filtering crucible. The most common is a fitted glass crucible containing a porous glass disc filter. Fitted glass crucibles are classified there porosity, coarse, medium, and fine. Another type of filtering crucible is the gauge crucible, a porcelain crucible with a perforated bottom. A glass fiber mat is placed in the crucible to retain the precipitate, which is transferred to the crucible in the same manner described for filter paper. The superintendent is drawn through the crucible with the assistance of a suction from a vacuum aspirator or pump as shown in figure 6. After filtration, precipitate is washed. Filtering removes most of the supernatant solution. Residual traces of the supernatant, however, must be removed to avoid a source of determinate error. Rinsing the precipitate to remove this residual matter must be done carefully to avoid significant losses of the precipitate. Of greatest concern is the potential for solubility losses. As usually, the rinsing medium is selected to ensure that solubility losses are negligible. In many cases, this simply involves the use of cold solvents or rinse solutions containing organic solvents such as ethanol. Precipitate containing acid or basic ions may experience solubility losses if the rinse solution's pH is not appropriately adjusted. When coagulation plays an important role in determining particle size, a volatile inert electrolyte is often added to the rinse water to prevent the precipitate from reverting into smaller particles that may not be retained by the filtering device. This process of reverting to smaller particles is called peptidation. The volatile electrolyte is removed when drying the precipitate. When rinsing a precipitate, there is a trade-off between introducing positive determinate error 
due to ionic impurities from the precipitating solution and introducing negative determinant errors from solubility losses. In general, solubility losses are minimized by using several small portions of the rinse solution instead of a single large volume. Changing the huge rinse solution for the presence of impurities is another way to ensure that the precipitate is not over rinsed. This can be done by testing for the presence of targeted solution ion and rinsing until the ion is no longer detected in a freshly collected sample of the rinse solution. For example, when chloride is known to be residual impurity, its presence can be tested by adding a small amount of silver nitrate to the collected rinse solution. A white precipitate of silver chloride indicates that silver is chloride ion is present and additional rinsing is necessary. Additional rinsing is not needed, however, if adding silver nitrate does not produce a precipitate. Finally, after separating the precipitate from its supernatant solution, the precipitate is dried to remove any residual traces of rinse solution and any volatile impurity. The temperature and method of drying depend on the method of filtration and the precipitate's desired chemical form. A temperature of 110 degrees is usually sufficient when removing water and other easily volatile impurities. A conventional laboratory oven is sufficient for this purpose. Higher temperatures require the use of a muffled furnace or a Bunsen and are necessary when the precipitate must be thermally decomposed before weighing or when using the filter paper. To ensure that drying is complete, the precipitate is repeatedly dried and weighed until a constant weight is obtained. Filter paper's ability to absorb moisture makes its removal necessary before weighing the precipitate. This is accomplished by folding the filter paper over the precipitate and transferring both the filter paper and the precipitate to a porcelain or platinum crucible. Gentle heating is used to first dry and then to char the filter paper. Once the paper begins to char, the temperature is slowly increased. Although the paper will often show traces of smoke, it is not allowed to catch fire as any precipitate retained by soot particles will be lost. After the paper is completely charred, the temperature is slowly raised to a higher temperature. At this stage, any carbon left after charring is oxidized to carbon dioxide. Fitted glass crucibles cannot withstand high temperatures and therefore should only be dried in an oven at temperature below 200 degrees centigrade. The glass fiber mats used in gauge crucibles can be heated to a maximum temperature of approximately 500 degrees centigrade. The quantitative application of precipitation gravimetry, which is based on a conservation of mass, requires that the final precipitate have a well-defined composition. Precipitates containing volatile ions or substantial amounts of hydrated water are usually dried at temperature that is sufficient to completely remove the volatile species. For example, one standard gravimetric method for the determination of magnesium involves the precipitation of magnesium ammonium phosphate into six molecules of water. Unfortunately, this precipitate is difficult to dry at lower temperature without losing an inconsistent amount of hydrated water and ammonia. Instead, the precipitate is dried at temperatures above 1000 degree centigrade where it decomposes to magnesium pyrophosphate. Quantitative calculations. In precipitation gravimetry, the relationship between the analyte and the precipitate is determined by the stoichiometry of the relevant reaction. Precipitation gravimetry can also be applied to the identification of inorganic, although not in common use, precipitation gravimetry still provides a reliable means for assessing the accuracy of other methods of analysis or for verifying the composition of standard reference material and this can be done with inorganic analysis and in organic analysis. The most important precipitants for inorganic cations are chromate, halide, hydroxide, oxalate, sulfate, 
sulfide and phosphate. Many inorganic anions can be determined using the same reactions by reversing the analyte and the precipitate. Several organic functional groups or heteroatoms can be determined using Gray matrix precipitation methods. The scale of operation for gravimetry is governed by the sensitivity of the balance and the availability of sample. To achieve an accuracy of 0.1% using an analytical balance with a sensitivity of plus minus 0.1 milligram, the precipitate must weigh at least 100 milligram. As a consequence, Precipitation gravimetry is usually limited to major or minor analytes and macro or meso samples. The analysis of trace level analytes or micro samples usually requires a micro analytical balance. So, students, in gravimetric analysis, you have studied different steps which are required for, for an accurate gravimetric analysis. The steps involved here are first step was precipitation, then the conditions in which precipitation should be done. After precipitation, the digestion process, how to increase the size of the particles in the precipitate, how to avoid formation of colloidal solution, how to avoid that particles go into the colloidal state. These all these things, how to avoid supersaturation, how to avoid co-precipitation, post-precipitation, how to take all the precautions so that your only substance which is precipitated is free from impurities, how to remove different types of impurities by washings, how to do washing of the precipitate after filtration, how to transfer your solution containing precipitate into the funnel, how to put filter paper in the funnel, how to transfer it, how to with the help of policemen to take out the last particle of the precipitate and put it into the funnel. Then how to take out the precipitate along with filter paper and then put it into the crucible how to burn it, how to combust it, how to ignite it and ignition should be such in a, such a condition that there should be no black carbon particle. Every carbon particle should be burned in the form of unreleased carbon dioxide gas there is. And if it is a gauge crucible, then it is put, precipitate is put in the gauge crucible, it is washed with the proper solvent and the solvent should be such which should dissolve the minimum amount of the precipitate almost it should be in precipitate should be insoluble in the in the solvent which is being used for washing purposes after that it should be put in the desiccator to dry and to remove water there and then to take out from the oven and immediately put into the desiccator that there should that there should be no absorption of water paper it is weight of crucible is taken again and again until we get a constant weight. Then by subtracting the weight of the crucible from the crucible plus precipitate weight, we find out the weight of the precipitate. Either from the silica crucible in which you have precipitate has ignited or from the gauge crucible. And then by back calculation, we find out the exact weight of the substance to be analyzed. And this is overall all the steps involved in gravimetric analysis.